Welcome to the Meb Faber Show, where the focus is on helping you grow and preserve your wealth. Join us as we discuss the craft of investing and uncover new and profitable ideas, all to help you grow wealthier and wiser. Better investing starts here. Meb Faber is the co-founder and chief investment officer at Cambria Investment Management. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Cambria's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of Cambria Investment Management or its affiliates. For more information, visit cambriainvestments.com. Welcome, podcast listeners. Today, we have an awesome, different kind of show for you, but it might just be one of our most actionable episodes ever. Our guest is an author, reporter, and SEC filings expert. She runs a business that focuses on scouring the hundreds of thousands of pages that are filled with the SEC day in and day out, sniffing out the actionable details that really matter to your portfolio. She's the author of the book, Financial Fine Print, and the founder of Footnoted. Welcome, Michelle Leader. Hey, thanks for having me. So, Michelle, as a former New Yorker, I mean, you've been in Los Angeles for how long now? Is it going on five, ten years? Not quite ten. It's five. I just punched my five-year card. It was actually... uh, my anniversary was February 3rd. That means you're officially in Angelino now. I refer to highways as the two or the 10 or, you know. 405. Well, as someone who lives west of the 405 and, and lives in any neighborhood in LA, uh, you start to learn about the challenges of getting around this this city. But so so have you fully ad- adapted at this point? I mean, are you uh, you figured out this this city? Are you, are you full transplant at this point? Oh, I wouldn't quite go that far. I mean, I still, uh, yeah. I mean, there's things I like about it. Like I love right now, I have the oranges and the grapefruit are uh, in season in my backyard. And I have to say, I like being able to go out there in February and pick an orange and a grapefruit, you know, off the tree. Can't do that in New York. Found any good pizza yet? Not so much on the pizza. Yeah, I have to uh, have to say I haven't found such great pizza yet. I keep trying. You know, there there's a Brooklyn transplant coming called I think it's Roberta's to somewhere on the west side. That's pretty awesome. And there's there's one near our office. So when you come down to your office, we'll do a another uh, lunch hangout and we'll take you to this one that's supposedly one of the best in LA. All right, enough about pizza. Let's get started. So give me a little background. Let's go back in time. I, I don't know that I know the answer of how you got to kind of where you are today. So maybe maybe give us a little bit of what your path was to eventually starting your own company and, and footnoted and maybe describe it in your words. Give us a little little overview. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I like to joke that everyone has a hobby and mine seems to be reading SEC filing. So, you know, I started, you know, the first 10 years of my career, I was a business journalist working for different newspapers. And one of the things I like to say is I was smart enough to get out of daily journalism when I could still get out because, you know, right now it's, of course, papers are really struggling and, and, and it's really kind of sad to see what, what's going on at different newspapers, especially here in L.A. at the L.A. Times. I mean, it just, you know, every time you pick it up, it just seems like it's, it's worse and worse. Although hopefully the new owner will help with some things there. Who knows? But, yeah, spent the first 10 years working for different daily newspapers. Was always sort of a bit of a document geek. I always loved reading, you know, I mean, one of my early jobs was in Florida And just going to the courthouse and reading court records, and I would get some great stories out of that, just reading some of that stuff and trying to figure out what was going on there. And, you know, SEC filings was one of my early things that I just like to read. I mean, they're just publicly available. Nobody's really paying much attention to them. And so I figured that person could be me. And so it is. And so I started, you know, I've been doing, it kind of grew out of my, you know, journalism was doing this document reporting And then eventually I started a business out of it. It wasn't quite that seamless, of course. When I first started the site, and I like to think of myself as almost a grandmother when it comes to financial blogs, which is how Footnoted really started, because I started it all the way back in 2003 when I wrote the book, Financial Fine Print. So it was really just meant to be a part of the book, really, you know, a continuing conversation related to the book. And I started the site, and 15 years later, we're uh, still plugging away, still reading SEC filings. That's the biggest compliment you can give a writer or an entrepreneur in general is, as we often say, is just surviving. And if you think back to the, we were a little bit later vintage. I think I started writing the blog in like 2005 or six, but it's a compliment to, to even still be around. So, okay, so tell me a little bit about footnoted. So let's let's get started. So, I'm a I'm a huge quant, but 
you know, historically filings and the accounting side and everything else involved has been not something I focus as much on. I remember going back to college, though, and going through a security analysis class where we were looking through a lot of these filings and trying to find red flags. And I'm pretty sure the case study was Lucent Technologies, but a lot of it was based on the old book, Financial Shenanigans by Shillett. And so give us maybe a quick broad overview on the filings in general, but also what kind of information you're looking for and, and how did this kind of evolve of what what, what are you writing about and what are you looking for and what are you writing about in these filings? Yeah, I mean, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a couple of key filings that you want to pay attention to that we tend to pay close attention to on the site. So, you know, right now, of course, you know, we're kind of at the height of 10K season. Those filings are due on or around the first week in March. I think the date this year is, don't quote me on it, but I think it's like March 4th is when the, when the filings are due. You know, they're due uh, 60 days after the end of the calendar year. And of course, a lot of companies are on a calendar, you know, on a December 31st year. So I think the filing deadline this year is actually, I think it's actually the 6th of February because they count out holidays and stuff like that. You're seeing a lot of 10Ks right now. Yesterday, actually, Valentine's Day, I should say, was actually the busiest day at the SEC for, for filings. Because you had all sorts of different filings coming in. You had a lot of 13Fs, which I know a lot of people pay attention to. Those are the disclosures that the large hedge funds update once a quarter. And those are due, you know, on or around the 14th, uh, 15th of the month. So you had a, a lot of those filings 45 days after the end of the quarter, I should say. So actually, the Edgar website crashed yesterday. It was so busy for filings that, you know, it crashed on Valentine's Day. That's funny. Happy Valentine's Day to the SEC. <laughs> so, all right. So take me through the process a little bit. So are you, is there a certain universe of companies you're looking at? Is it a certain uh, watch list or are you kind of updating it at requests of investors and subscribers? Do you print all these suckers out and sit in your reclining chair by the fire and read these? Or are you, is it, it what, what's kind of the process for how you go through this? Because it seems to me like it would just be a massive amount of information. Talk talk to us a little bit about how you go about it. Yeah, well, not the fireplace. I sometimes sit out in the backyard, though, and, uh, you know, read the filings because, you know, that's the beauty of the L.A. weather. You know, I don't print things out. You know, I think that would just be a giant waste of trees. I know some people, you know, some very smart people who do print out actual filings and kind of mark them up and, and highlight them and everything. And, you know, I think that's certainly a method. But I think that the way that I read filings, that would just be kind of lunacy and it would, you know, really waste a lot of trees. So what we're looking at is, you know, it's a little bit of both. I mean, there's some companies that we know are sort of, let's call them bad eggs, right? We just know that they tend to be more aggressive when it comes to the filings. It's just some sort of learned knowledge that we have based on, you know, having been doing this for 15 years now. And, you know, so there's some companies that we'll pay a lot closer attention to, for example. It could be a company that we know to be sort of aggressive. It could be a company that we've written that we flagged a lot recently. And so we want to make sure that we're looking at every single one of their filings in general, we are looking at a lot of filings. Roughly, I would say anything within the Russell 3000 is more or less fair game. We tend to draw the line at about a billion dollars in market cap, although we will go below it for certain names and certain companies, of course. But we don't tend to look at a lot of the filings for like, you know, OTC companies. It's very, very rare that we'll go like sub 250 million in market cap, for example. And so out of what you're looking for, talk to me a little bit about the broad categories, because I know you, you look at lots of things, whether it's board and pay issues or financial disclosure, maybe operational issues, probes, lawsuits, crisis, all that good stuff. What's, what's kind of the main checklist of things that you're going through in these filings and, and really looking for? You know, we like to look a lot. Obviously, the changes are important. Like, so if a company... You know, it's all really about the language. I think a lot of people often think that we're looking at the numbers pretty intensively, but we actually don't pay as close attention to the numbers. We're looking at really the language that the companies are using to describe the numbers, hence the name footnoted, right? We're looking at the footnotes. The footnotes are usually language used to describe the numbers that they're just, you know, that they're, they're explaining because the numbers can't exactly speak for themselves. 
And so, you know, we do a lot of that. And one of the things that we find is that, you know, changes, of course, I mean, I was looking at a company the other day and one area that we spent a lot of time looking at is like the, um, especially at this time of year with earnings coming out is the forward looking statements. And so companies will put long amounts of language to explain their forward looking statements. And so we like to look at the changes that the companies do there. So I can't remember the name of the company right now, but one company we were looking at had a lot of extra language in there about their forward-looking statements, and that certainly prompted us to take a closer look at it. Are, are you using, say, software to kind of compare prior versions? Or are you doing keyword searches? Both, both keyword searches and also software that allows you to compare, you know, changes easily. There's any number of different systems that allow you to kind of closely look at what changes have been made, you know, whether it's a black line version. I mean, there's, there's a number of different services that allow you to do that pretty easily. So we're looking at that, but we're also looking at words. I mean, but, you know, as, as I like to talk about when I do presentations, language, especially, you know, the English language or really quite frankly, any language, I'm not a linguist per se, but language is very malleable. And so there's a lot of different ways to say the same type of thing. And so, you know, one of the examples I've often given when I've done the presentation is, you know, if the company chooses to describe a different, you know, use a different word to describe something and you're only looking for that word, let's say you're looking for the word subpoena and a company uses a different language, you're only, you're not going to find that because the word subpoena is missing. And so, I, you know, it's actually kind of a funny situation. I believe it was Goldman Sachs a couple of years ago, instead of using the word subpoena, they did something like, we received an invitation to respond to the DOJ. So, <laughs> you know, an invitation to Crafty. respond is not like, hey, can you make it to my 40th birthday party? It's not like an evite. You know, if, if you get an invitation to respond to the DOJ, I'm pretty sure now I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that that's not a voluntary situation that, you know, you can blow off if you don't feel like it. <laughs> that's like describing bankruptcy as saying the bank invited us to pay some of our bills last month. <laughs> that's funny. You have to remember that these filings really, they're written by lawyers. And, you know, I'm sure not to, you know, say anything too negative about lawyers, but basically, you know, most lawyers are paid to massage the English language or whatever language they happen to be writing in. I'm sure it's not unique to, you know, English speaking, um, you know, lawyers. It's basically meant to massage the language and make things look a little bit less innocuous, um, a little less serious, I guess, or a little more innocuous than they, they otherwise might be. Give me maybe an example of some of the, you know, I mean, you've done this so many times and, and there has to be just some hair pulling out disclosures and crazy things. Maybe walk us through a couple examples of some things you've seen or maybe suggestions on, you know, kind of what to look for when you're saying, um, you know, it can be the absurd, it can be the egregious, it can be even anything that's ever, you know, it's surprised you or just kind of what's, what's a normal thing that pops out that you say, yep, red flag. I mean, I think, you know, obviously there's a lot of different areas. So, I mean, you know, if you're looking at compensation and you see, unusual compensation or an unusual stock grant, that will jump out at me. If you see, you know, a lot of extra language to describe their earnings, or you start seeing like adjusted EBITDA or like, you know, like what looks like a gymnastic routine to describe someone's earnings. You know, there was another company I was looking at the other day. It was like, well, we define adjusted EBITDA as this, except, you know, I mean, the, the list of exemptions that they were including it was just like, okay, well, I would be a millionaire if I didn't include my mortgage payment and, you know, my kid's school and my kid, you know, the baseball practice. And like, you know, I mean, it just like, it just seems like if you're going to deduct every single thing and not count that as an actual expense or as an, you know, if you count it as an exceptional expense, then it just kind of raises questions about what is the point of the business um, or not the point of the business, but like what, it just seems like unusual to me if you start deducting all sorts of different things that you would most people would consider to be a routine business expense. I mean, you know, rent is a routine business expense. Why was this company not counting rent? On kind of the scale of reddest of red flags to kind of pink flags, which aren't so bad, but but you know, are, are I'm thinking from the investor standpoint on things that may move or drive a stock. What's kind of like the worst? things you see because like like investor like uh, the board compensation or something it may be something you're like you know what 
that's unfortunate. I can't believe he's paying some, himself that, but it may not determine the future of you know this company succeeding or not. What like from an investor standpoint, what are kind of some of the main really nasty things that that you put in the category of like this is pretty bad? I mean, I think like when companies start changing their risk factors pretty dramatically, that's something that you want to pay close attention to. I remember you know a company in particular. There was a company called GT Advanced Technology. And this was a couple of years ago, but like in August of uh, in their filing that they made in the queue, they started, they were a big supplier to Apple. And, you know, the stock was going up because, of course, you know, anything tied to Apple was doing, you know, well and, you know, probably still is. But this was a couple of years ago. And there was new language in their risk factors talking about how they were super dependent on Apple and if things didn't quite work out with Apple or the product wasn't up to Apple's standards or whatever, you know, things could go south, you know, pretty quickly. Obviously, I'm, you know, paraphrasing here, but there was a lot more, you know, language that was basically talking about what could potentially happen if things didn't work out. And, you know, it was new language in that filing. And lo and behold, things did not work out with Apple. And the company wound up filing for bankruptcy a couple months later. You know, it was in October of, I believe, October of 2014 that they filed for bankruptcy. And so at the time that we flagged it, the stock was trading at around $17 a share. And, you know, obviously, when they filed for bankruptcy, it went down to, you know, zero. So we think that, like, you know, basically a rule of thumb is, is that there are no accidents in SEC filings. Why did this company all of a sudden increase the amount of disclosure in their risk factors? It's because their attorneys who were advising them were probably saying, hey, if this thing with Apple doesn't work out, then we're going to have to, uh, you know, we, we really should warn investors about it. I mean, as you know, Matt, there's like a, you know, a very active plaintiff bar in this country, right? And so a lot of this dance is basically between opposing lawyers. You know, when you think about an SEC filing, it's the lawyers who are working on behalf of the company and what they feel they have to disclose. And then, you know, there's a very active plaintiff's bar who is saying, hey, they didn't disclose this properly. And so we're going to sue them over it. So I think there's like sort of a choreographed, a very carefully choreographed dance between the two groups of lawyers about if we disclose too much, that could, of course, lead to a lawsuit. But if we don't disclose enough, that could also lead to a lawsuit. Yeah, you know, it's it's for someone, you know, like myself, who's been an investment manager, but writer for so long, I've, I've come to take a little more appreciation for wordsmithing over the years, because it plays a big impact. We spend a lot of time writing our, our SEC filings. And luckily, we're surrounded by lots of wonderful lawyers that help us out. Because as a engineer quant, my words with smithing is, is fairly horrendous. What's some um, so okay, so as, as people were kind of thinking about these filings, and you mentioned this consistency of this Friday night dump. So talk to me a little bit about the Friday night dump. And I wonder if there's like a distribution of bad behavior. If, if, if you could actually like historically look back at all your red flag filings, if, if any of them tend to group or, or incorporate the same sorts of tells, like explain to us a little bit about the Friday night dump and maybe, maybe there's something there. Yeah. I mean, so basically the Friday night dump is, you know, as you know, after 4 PM Eastern time, on Friday, the markets close, but the SEC remains open for filings for another hour and a half. So that's 90 minutes when companies can disclose things when there's no, you know, trading going on, really. I mean, of course, there's aftermarkets or whatever, but there's no real trading going on. And so companies tend to dump stuff that, you know, is unflattering or potentially problematic late on a Friday afternoon between four o'clock and 530. And actually, you know, even closer to 530, I mean, last week, for example, there was a filing by Tesla, an 8K by Tesla that we thought was kind of interesting, where they were correcting something that Elon Musk had said. And that was filed at like five, I think I want to say 528. I mean, you can go back and look at it. But I'm sure it was not coincidental that that was filed then. And the way the wording was, we needed to correct the record on something that was said during the conference call earlier in the week. Well, you know, I forget when the conference call was, but they certainly could have come out and said it at another time, correcting the record earlier than like Friday at 5, you know, 29 p.m. 
The same thing with a filing by Wynn. You know, I mean, of course, Wynn has been, you know, the casino, Wynn Casinos has been in the news a lot for the, uh, you know, the Wall Street Journal did a great job of breaking that story. And there was a filing by them talking about, you know, I don't follow the company as closely, but it was, you know, a disclosure basically made at 529 p.m. about the longstanding argument between Steve and Elaine Wynn and how, which really prompted this whole thing in the beginning. So, you know, and about the her ability, Elaine Wynn's ability to sell the shares and the agreement and everything as a result of the divorce. And, you know, again, things like that, like you see them, you know, I would say like, especially after 515, you know, even though we tend to pay close attention to all filings made after 4 p.m. on a Friday, the magic hour or the magic 15 minutes is really from 515 to 530. And the beauty of the SEC Edgar site, I mean, it, it's, you know, Edgar certainly has its limitations. But one of the nice things is it actually lets you go down to the tenth of a second. So you can see when a filing is made at like 5.30 and 45, you know, tenths of a second, which is kind of funny to see because you really see the negative filings that are made. Um, You know, there definitely is a correlation. You know, I am not a quant, but there's definitely a correlation between I've noticed between the filings that are made late on a Friday afternoon and, you know, sort of negative information. I wonder if at some point, like the amount that you've mentioned it in the past, if these companies are like, all right, Michelle is going to tweet about this if we do this again. So actually, we're going to we're going to file for this at six in the morning or some other time that <laughs> that people aren't uh, people aren't around because we know she'll be looking for it. I imagine that might be the case. But I was laughing when you were giving the Tesla example, because one of my favorite tweets, I don't know who to attribute this to, but, you know, Elon has been pretty aggressive in his promises for Tesla production and someone tweeted when when the SpaceX recently sent out the Tesla into space they said are is, is Elon going to count this as a delivery um, which I was which I was laughing at you know I'm looking at the filing right now so for example it was actually made I'm sorry it was made at 514 and 26 tenths of a second so not quite after 515 but close enough on a Friday afternoon and what they say is Tesla is clarifying the following statement made by Elon Musk you know, during Tesla's fourth quarter and full year financial results conference call on February 7th. So why did it take them two days, almost three full days to correct the record on that? You know, is it coincidental that it was filed like late on a Friday afternoon? I don't think so. Are are there any other kind of memorable disclosures or things you've noticed maybe in the past couple of years or ever, if you have any particularly fond ones, but anything else that pops out in your head as, as good examples of just the crazy disclosures that these companies will make? Well, I mean, I think one of my favorites is actually kind of an oldie, but it's still a goodie, was uh, Chesapeake Energy, you know, disclosing that they had paid over $12 million for Aubrey McClendon's map collection, I think is, you know, sort of a classic one. And it was buried, you know, in a proxy filing. A lot of times, you know, the proxies can be pretty interesting, Um, certainly for the compensation-related information, but I think that the related party transactions are really the meat and the potatoes of of proxy statements. I mean, even if you go back and you look at Enron, all of the disclosures were in the related party transactions. It was very hard to understand what exactly they were disclosing, but they were disclosing a lot of information about different related parties. So I think, you know, that was certainly one of my favorite ones was the Chesapeake one where they talked about how they had spent $12 million for this map collection, and they knew how much to pay for it because the person who had assembled the map collection for McClendon was the one who had appraised it. And so it was just sort of like, you know, you know, I mean, I think there's like jujitsu moves that are, you know, less complicated. It's some of these, you know, disclosures are just pretty, it's just amazing. I mean, I just give the lawyers who write these things a lot of creativity points for doing this sort of thing. As we're thinking about it, I mean, I know you had um, referred to another part uh, with proxies as the sexiest of the SEC filings. D- maybe define proxies for listeners and give us give us a broad overview of what why you think that's uh, so important. Yeah, well, I mean, proxies at the most basic level, of course, are an invitation to the annual meeting. So, you know, you as a shareholder, I mean, I own shares in any number, you know, probably I have, I don't know, 20 or so positions. You know, I get invited to the annual meeting and I get asked to cast my vote. Of course, it's not a real election in the sense that what my vote, whoever wins, gets a say because the company still has the right to basically, even if shareholders, 
vote in favor of something, it's really the company's decision on whether they choose to enact that or not. So it's not a real democracy in, in that sense. But, you know, on the, at the most basic level, a proxy is an invitation to the annual meeting, but proxies also include a lot of other information that can be very helpful. And again, you know, I mean, I think obviously different people are going to have different views about this. I mean, not, you know, there's a lot of people who don't read the filings and, you know, and that's fine. I'm not saying that you have to, but I think that, you know, if you own shares in something and you don't want to wind up with a bad surprise one day, it does make sense to read the filings. So the proxies will include information on compensation. I think that, you know, is helpful to know what the CEO, how they're paying themselves. Is it mostly a cash position? Are they getting a lot of, you know, stock? I mean, what's really going on there? I like to know what the directors are making because I think that directors can be very, learning what they're making can be very telling. I mean, especially if a director is sitting on three or four different boards and they're making, you know, 250 to 300,000 for each of those part-time jobs. You know, that's something that I want to know about. I want to know that, you know, the audit committee is, you know, relatively solid because those are the people that are sort of overlooking the numbers and trying to understand that. And then I also like to look at the related party transactions because I think that those are, you know, again, as I said, with the Enron example and Chesapeake and countless others, I think that those are, you know, often can be very important and really give you sort of insight into a company that you don't get necessarily in other places. And so how, how often, like, what's the process of your writing and publishing? Is it kind of a consistent, or are you doing like updates? Is it a monthly thing? Is it, what's kind of the, how, how does it work? Well, unfortunately, I mean, we're not providing as much free content as we used to when we started because the model just isn't there. I mean, it's not an ad supported model. I guess if I wanted to just write about Apple and Tesla, maybe I could get some ads on that. But, you know, I think that, you know, what we, we moved a number of years ago, we moved to a subscription based model and decided that, you know, really um, it's, it's a subscription based model that's designed for institutional investors. And so the amount of content that we're providing, you know, sort of for free to the public has declined pretty dramatically just because I feel like the model really isn't there for that. So we try to do what we can on Twitter. We recently began experimenting with something on Twitter where we're doing sort of a mini version of the Friday Night Dump through a paid Twitter feed. We partnered with the guys behind Bespoke Investment, and they created sort of a paid curated Twitter feed where we're doing that. But the majority of the content that we're providing these days is behind the wall. Yeah. And, and the, so real quick, I, the listeners can check out the bespoke thing. It's called Primo Social. It's actually a pretty interesting idea. But that's kind of what I meant is, you know, this this premium service you have, how often are you kind of writing these articles? Is it a monthly? Is it a quarterly? Is it a kind of updates to the subscribers? Is it you do conference calls? What's a, how, how do you kind of deliver this content that you are researching? So a lot of it is based on the tickers that our subscribers are focused on. You know, for the most part, we let our subscribers enter their tickers. And so we pay close attention to those. And then we can, you know, deliver content, you know, via email if there's a ticker match. So let's say I have a client who has 30 tickers that they're keeping an eye on. If we find something on one of those 30 tickers, they'll get an email alert about that. You know, we also have the Primo thing, the Friday night dump on Primo that we're doing. And we have newsletters. We basically have a summary newsletter that we send out on Sunday evenings before markets. You know, we send it out, you know, relatively late on a Sunday so that it's in their inbox. You know, they can look at it first thing Monday morning before the markets open. And so it's interesting to think about. So have you ever seen a disclosure or just an announcement that just solo by itself would kind of cause you, and I don't know if you, you're trading any of these names or if it's clients only, but do you think they would call it like that single disclosure would be like, you have to short this company? That's the most ridiculous. Is that often or is it more just kind of brush strokes of, hey, these guys have some ridiculous compensation. That's a, you know, one X against them. And hey, they, they did this weird transaction. That's another X. Have they, how often is it that it's kind of like a one-off boom? This is this is a haymaker, like this thing is, is going down. I would say that that's very rare. I mean, honestly, you know, I think back to like that GT advanced technology. I mean, I could probably count the number of examples where you saw something that was just so crazy egregious and lo and behold, it went to, you know, bankruptcy. I mean, I can think of another example 
a number of years ago with American Airlines did something similar where they, you know, warned about something and, and was a precursor to what happened. You know, of course, I mean, look, the markets have been going up now for what, you know, almost 10 years. And, you know, you have, you know, even when you see negative information, it doesn't necessarily mean that the stock is going to go that way. So sometimes, you know, you see something negative and it doesn't seem like anyone really cares or pays attention to it. There's certainly a lot of uh, short sellers who would tell you that these days. I mean, my friend, you know, Herb Greenberg, for example, would, you know, talk to you about that. I was just laughing as I was thinking about this. I said, maybe a good new business line for you will be footnoted crypto. And you can read all of the terrible ICO uh, announcements and say, this is literally just a white paper. Why are you guys giving this person or organization a billion dollars? So when, you, when you're ready to launch that, let me know. I'll okay. be your first subscriber. Um, <laughs> How often has this ever happened, or maybe it happens all the time? And I know most of the research is firewalled, but even going back in the day when you're writing a little more publicly or tweeting, how often do the companies reach out and you know either just say, "Hey, you're wrong," or threaten litigation, or or, or what? Is that, is that a pretty common occurrence, or no? You know, I would count that I, again very very few times. I would say one situation I remember sticks out, which was Dell. Quite a number of years ago, uh, I was reading a related party transaction. It had something to do with Michael Dell, you know, Dell, the company buying a company from Michael Dell's brother and paying what seemed like an unusual amount of money for it. You know, when you read the footnotes, it was sort of, you know, it seemed like kind of a convoluted deal. And I remember that time, you know, Dell computer reaching out to me and saying, you got this all wrong. But I really can't think of a lot of other examples where that happens. You know, either the companies aren't paying attention to what I'm writing. I'm certainly not, you know, overwhelmed with my self-importance to think that, you know, companies are, you know, obsessing over what I'm writing. Or they know that, you know, hopefully my reputation is solid enough that, you know, I write from the SEC filings. I don't traffic in innuendo. I don't, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things that a lot of people, for example, who are writing about Tesla I don't really get involved in that. I just, you know, write from the filing. You know, I don't really get into his personality or what he's promised or not promised or blah, blah, blah. I just write, this is what the filing said. And there's also probably another element, which is usually when they're disclosing these shady things, they probably don't want to bring any more attention to it than they already had. Which, so if they engage you, then they're kind of admitting this this shadiness. I was laughing as we were getting ready for this interview. I I was watching some old videos you had done. And there was a great one, which was kind of near dear to my heart because I grew up partially in Colorado where the Quest CEO was using... Oh, yeah. the, can, you, can you mention that one real quick? I was laughing at that uh, this week. Yeah. Was that where the, uh, the guys, uh, the former CEO, when he was hired, he got his, as part of his deal, he got his high school, his daughter who was going to high school at the time, had access to the private jet to fly back and forth between San Francisco and and Denver. And I just remember thinking, like, aren't there airlines that provide that route that a high school kid, you know, doesn't uh, need to do that? I don't know if that's what you were specifically mentioning. But yeah, like, I was. I was I was I was laughing at it. That's funny. You know, I mean, when I went to high school, I took like, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn. I went to, I took a, you know, a city bus. I certainly didn't have access to the Gulf Stream to get me back and forth to high school. That's funny. So. Talk to me about a little bit of like practical. So uh, there's probably a lot of people listening to this and this would, I would be terrible at your job, by the way, and it would be kind of my nightmare. Like I I would be awful at this. But if a listener, let's say they said, you know what, I've got my 10 holdings. I've had these forever. I want to track. What sort of time commitment are we talking about? So, you know, kind of per stock per year. Is it you're looking at like an hour a year? Is it like five hours? What's kind of, how's, how's this work? I mean, I would say like, you know, depending on how a lot of it is, how quickly you read and how good you are, you know, obviously with anything you, you get better with time. I mean, I have, I feel like I still learn things about SEC filings all the time. And I've been doing this now for, you know, 15 years, reading documents pretty closely. So, you know, I, I would say that, you know, maybe five hours a year per stock, So, um, you know, because the the 10K is going to take you, you know, somewhere between an hour and two hours. If you really, you know, skim it carefully, it could take you probably two hours to do. And then the individual 10 Qs, you know, let's say somewhere between like, you know, 45 minutes to do three of those, 
proxy statement should take you about a half hour. Yeah, I'd say about, I guess about five hours, you know, and then obviously the miscellaneous 8Ks, you know, but one of the examples, you mentioned Quest just now, one of the examples I like to tell and how I really got into this early on was that I had bought some shares of Quest Communications and, you know, I think I had spent like $5,000, which, you know, 20 years ago was very real money to me. And, you know, I watched as the stock went up and up and then all of a sudden it went down and I, you know, really started on this whole thing. You know, if you go back to the book, I mean, I kind of talk about all of the things that I could have found if I had just spent the time reading Quest's SEC filings. You know, I could have prevented, you know, myself from losing that five grand that I lost. And since I wasn't, you know, I, I felt like it could have taken me, you know, maybe about five hours to do that. And uh, since I wasn't making $1,000 an hour then, you know, it, it was certainly time that could have been well spent. You know, I mean, I think this this is kind of related but tangential, you know, with this recent, you know, there's been a lot of very minor recent market gyrations, but they would caused uh, some major issues for some funds. And I think it's a good suggestion for people in general on the investment side who invest in these ETFs or ETNs or mutual funds to actually read the prospectus, because in many of these you learn things and like there was this volatility ETN uh, or ETF that I don't even know how it was structured, but if it went down 80%, it was liquidating. And how many investors actually read that perspective? Probably zero. But it's funny because we often talk about investing side that there's studies that show that people spend more time shopping for a TV than they do planning their retirement. And so it's the same. We see so many examples in these prospectuses. We say, why would anyone ever invest in that fund? That's crazy. But people, you know, in many cases uh, are, are lazy, right? They just, they want to kind of wing it. So same thing applies to, uh, to the um, investing side as well. So you've been doing this for a while. Talk to me a little bit about the changes you've seen um, over the last 10, 15 years. And so partially I'm referring to corporate governance. So are companies, you know, over the past 10, 15 years, are they more or less likely to sweep stuff under the rug? Have the various reform laws that have been enacted, are they working? What's kind of like, what's been, what's changed over the past 15 years, if anything? No, I think that, you know, there's, there's certainly companies that are, you know, uh, you see trends, of course, you know, about disclosure. I mean, you know, like, so a lot of these companies use the same, you know, there's, there's probably like, you know, 20 or so law firms that focus on, you know, writing the SEC filings. Of course, there's more, but let's say most of the big companies are using, you know, similar law firms. And so, you know, they'll like, you know, law firm one will say, hey, what, how are you handling cybersecurity disclosure this year? Um, you know, and maybe we should do something, you know, similar. So, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of like repetition. I mean, you know, if you talk to any lawyers or you know any lawyers, they're not reinventing the wheel on a regular basis, right? They're taking, you know, they're cutting and pasting a lot of stuff that they've, you know, previously disclosed. You know, I mean, you know, even if you do in your own personal, like, you know, you look at a subscription agreement, a lot of it is like, you know, it's not, you know, pristine language. It's all been written before and just kind of cut and paste it. Um, so I think that, you know, you have, um, you know, in terms of how it's changed, it's obviously, you see, you know, some companies trying to disclose, you know, it depends on what the SEC is really focused on enforcing. For a while, it seemed like the SEC, you know, was really focusing on, uh, you know, companies that were not properly disclosing related party transactions. And so you saw companies try to respond to that. Certainly after, um, you know, Dodd-Frank, you saw some more disclosures related to that. You know, when I first started doing this, it was like Sarbanes-Oxley was new. And so you started seeing, you know, that was, you know, there were disclosures in response to that. So it kind of seems like it comes in waves. I mean, I definitely, obviously, you know, uh, without getting too political, you know, the current, you know, SEC regulatory apparatus tends to be, you know, more focused on what regulations can we cut. And so I think that companies are tending to, you know, respond to that now, Um, you know, whereas maybe a couple of years ago, there was a lot of focus on, you know, on Dodd-Frank and like what the regulations were with that. And so you saw companies, you know, responding to that. Interesting. I I was laughing because in my early days as a young, know-nothing writer, I remember uh, putting a policy, privacy policy or whatever it was, disclaimer on my blog and same sort of thing as I had, I had found, I said, all right, who are the top two or three 
investment writers out there that are bloggers and let me go look at their privacy policy because they probably paid a million dollars to their legal team to write this. Why don't I just do a little copy and pasting because I can use this. And then I remember this is so funny. I forgot to remove, uh, I, you know, I changed all the names. I edited it, but I forgot my, my uh, control F must not have find one of the names because eventually uh, they're legal. It said, um, in case we own this blog, you probably uh, are not covered on the umbrella of our po- uh, privacy policy. <laughs> so, um, but that's funny because it happens a lot. You know, we have a lot of buddies who are ETF issuers that say, hey, we're just going to go copy BlackRock's filing because they pay millions of dollars in legal. So we'll just edit it and, and move on. It kind of makes sense. That's funny. I'd, I've forgotten about that. Um, so it's kind of thinking about um, winding this down because we can only keep you for so long. Um, what if you think about today, 2018, and I know you probably can't give too much because uh, this is your paid service, this is what you do for a living. Is there anything that's kind of um, popped out in the last um, last few months or any companies in general that are kind of been some some interesting disclosures or related things you can mention and if you can't that's fine too but anything in the last uh little while that's been been interesting you know i mean i think you know um one of the things we found a couple months ago that we thought was interesting you know we're always looking for companies that are making up new metrics um so you know the numbers themselves remember when a company announces whatever earnings or whatever you know it wants to put out there you know, they make it seem like it's, you know, uh, sort of this is how it's always done. But, you know, we're always looking for these new metrics that companies use. And so one of the things that we thought was kind of interesting was looking at Twitter, for example. About a year or so ago, they started, instead of talking about uh, MAUs, monthly active users, which is, you know, a well-defined metric that, you know, companies use, they started talking about DAUs. And, you know, normally that definition is, you know, daily active users, but Twitter was defining it somewhat different. And they were saying daily active usage. Now think about that. What is the difference between usage and users? Um, So like those are the types of things that, you know, it might seem like, you know, it's, uh, you know, we wrote a piece, you know, um, does Twitter deserve points for creativity? And we put that, you know, um, you know, that was something that we did, you know, for our paid subscribers. And, you know, where we think is kind of interesting there is, you know, of course, um, you know, it, it's it's one of those ways that like companies massage language that we think is worth paying closer attention to. So, you know, as it turns out, Twitter is the only company that uses daily active usage. You know, there are other companies that use daily active users, although I think, you know, what we see is the most common metric is, you know, the monthly active is the MAUs, you know, and this may be getting into the weeds a little bit too much for, you know, the folks who are listening to the podcast or not, but it's like that type of subtle change that we, I think is like sort of the footnoted bread and butter is, you know, asking the question, why is a company changing the metric and what is, what are they gaining from that and what's going on there? And that's what we think is, you know, sort of, where our service really shines, I guess. You know, I think that's the that's interesting takeaway because so much of this to me is it's not necessarily just the one disclosure or sentence that kind of, you know, stands out and says, oh my God, we have to go short Twitter now because of this. But it's more of the accumulation of knowledge. It's almost like a, a quilt of all these different patches of, of pieces of info and that you know, certain companies are more apt to be a little bit shady and kind of take liberty and other com- companies, you know, tend to tend to not be. Is, is that kind of how you think about it as well? Is that a good a c- characterization? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that, you know, it, it really is, quite frankly, Meb, it is a mosaic. And so, you know, you had asked me earlier, is there ever like sort of a screaming red flag that you see that like, oh, my God, you got to get out of the stock right away. or You got to short the stock. Usually by the time it's that, you know, that situation there's been signals all along. I mean, you know, look at look at the Kodak disclosure that all of a sudden they were jumping. You had talked about the ICO space. You know, what was it about a month ago? Kodak decided that they were jumping into ICO into uh, you know doing that. Was that an example of something to like get the hell out of Kodak? I don't know. Or what about the like the twenty things that happened leading up to that? Um, you, you never know really. You know, when a stock goes down. You know, I think that. 
you know, unlike there's a lot of people who will say like, I called this right. And I, you know, I'm so smart and I called this right. The bottom line is, is that, you know, everyone, you know, hindsight is always 2020. So like, you know, even with, you know, the GTA T example, I can point to, I can say like, okay, we saw that. And, you know, two months later, the company filed for bankruptcy. But, you know, hindsight is always 2020. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it just reminds me, we, we look at a lot of investment strategies and funds and, and certainly some, we used to write about F squared back in the day and, and their lawyers made me take it down or ask politely to take it down. But it was the same sort of thing where they're the weight of the evidence kept stacking up. And you, I, I did, you know, you never know for certain, um, on some of these, like you, you they, I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt, but you start to see one shady thing, then another shady thing and another. And, uh, it's interesting cause it's kind of that collection or some of the parts that ends up giving you the full story. Michelle, do you, uh, and I don't know if this, this question is going to apply to you because usually it's an investment manager on this podcast, but we always ask people if you can think back and this, this could be childhood, it could be good, it could be bad. What's been your most memorable investment on your own? And if there hasn't been one, since you're more of a writer than a, than a PM, you can give a most memorable disclosure, but feel free to take the question either way. You know, I like to, one of the things I like to look at, and I've always been fascinated by this is looking at some of the signals that you see in filings that, you know, perhaps, you know, a lot of what I look at is sort of on the negative side, but sometimes you can find some positive signals in the filings too. And so every now and then I'll switch hats and I like to look at, you know, to see, are there some disclosures that, you know, maybe impact a stock um, in a positive way, you know, and, uh, you know, there's just the number of examples that come to mind. And I really, you know, my investing is, you know, probably, you know, small time compared to, you know, some of the other folks you've interviewed. It's really just, you know, my retirement portfolio. I'm not doing it for anyone else, you know, and even, you know, my kids college fund, I'm doing that sort of as a, as a, in a 529 where I don't have direct control over it, you know, just kind of picking the year type of thing. So I think that, you know, you know, nothing is really, really coming like a, a particular stock or anything is coming to mind. But I think that, you know, it's always good to challenge your mind and challenge your brain to look, you know, if you're reading the filings anyway, you know, and in general, I do read it for negative things. Sometimes it's interesting to look for positive things, too. Interesting. How often does that happen? <laughs> um, you know, it happens with some regularity. I mean, you know, we always think of like the filings being where companies go to hide different things. But, you know, sometimes you can pick up on something that is, you know, that they're not actively touting that, you know, actually impacts the stock in a positive way. Probably in the Wednesday noon filing, not Friday <laughs> night, not Friday night. Um, well, one last question that kind of popped to mind as you look forward, you know, a lot of what you do is inside your brain from experience, um, you know, and, and as more and more of the world is getting automated and words like big data and AI, you know, do you foresee kind of your role over the next five, 10 years? Are there going to be some sort of augmented software or concepts you think that will play a role? Do you think this will kind of um, be something that, you know, you'll continue on in the same fashion? Or are you, are you thinking about um, any changes to the, to the process at all? You know, I mean, I've looked at AI to a certain extent. I think the problem that you have is like you really need to train AI pretty carefully. I mean, I'd love to figure out a way to like basically take what's inside my brain and kind of merge that with, you know, really smart programming. So I could definitely see, you know, I guess the short answer is I can definitely see uh, an ability to automate it more. But I think that you know, as long as lawyers are involved in writing the filings, you're going to need, you know, humans to actually read and try to interpret what the lawyers are saying. Michelle, this has been so much fun. Where can people follow all your various offerings, writings, tweets, etc.? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, you can obviously are in the, the footnoted Twitter feed. We do do stuff, you know, on that. Um, you know, not as active on the website as we used to be in providing free content, but we still do, you know, you can sign up on footnoted.com for our, um, you know, updates when we do provide them, you know, Twitter, I would say is more active. And then if you're interested in checking out our Friday night dump, um, you can, you know, look at that, that is, uh, uh it's called footnoted FND for Friday night dump. Awesome. And that's a paid service on the Primo site. Well, good. Look, thanks for taking so much for the time to, to join us today. When, uh, as a thank you, we'll, we'll have to go explore some 
uh, some LA pizza when you get a chance. Yep, sounds great. Awesome. Listeners, thanks for taking the time to listen. Welcome feedback, questions for the mailbag at feedback at the As a reminder, you can always find the show notes and other episodes at mebfaber.com forward slash podcast. Subscribe to the show on iTunes. If you're enjoying it, hating it, please leave a review. Let Jeff and I know how we're doing. Thanks for listening, friends, and good investing.